I haven't really been on social media for a while. I've poked in and out every once in a while on X and Instagram, but I haven't really spent much time there since I started my Murdoch Mafia series. But after the news with Jersey, I've been checking in more often. I came across an old tweet of someone that I've followed for quite a while by the name of Julie Carpenter. She's absolutely brilliant. I used to love looking up her post during the trial. If you use X, you should definitely follow her. Of course, once I saw that, I started digging and digging, and wow! The branches to this Alex Murdoch story are out of control and never-ending. This one, like my last two updates, involves the Egg Juror's book. This time, it's about her co-author, a guy who goes by Crime and Cask. A guy who comes here to my channel from time to time in a vain attempt to fight with me. A lot of us have the impression that he is obsessed with trying to prove convicted murderer Alex Murdoch innocent. He wrote his own book and now he's teamed up with fallen juror Myra the Egg Lady, along with a few other names you'll recognize to produce yet another book. And one of the tips I got, but I didn't look it up because I don't have Facebook and I only got a screenshot of the book information, but apparently this guy is actually selling merchandise based on Alex Murdoch and now Myra. Another all-time low was hit today, folks. What sort of person would do this? They say birds of a feather flock together. Do you want to find out? Let's get started. This is Legal Updates with Cassidy. The Egg Juror's co-author knows a lot about crime. Now we know why he supports Alex Murdoch. Welcome. So this was the tweet I came across today. It says that James Paul Seidel, aka Crime and Cask, recently pled guilty to PPP fraud. The kind of person it takes to cheat the government when they were putting out emergency funds during a pandemic to help keep people afloat, not just the business owner, but the employees, is a special kind of person indeed. And I'm glad that after the dust settled, they started investigating the ones who committed fraud to get these funds. These funds were so necessary for so many people, and these people seemed to think that because they were so easy to get at the time when it was all a frenzy, that no one would ever sit down when it was all over and take a look at them. They mistook the ease in application and the almost instant payout as an easy cash grab. This tweet is even worse, saying he claimed to be a vet and that he wasn't when he applied. And we see the loan data states that it's owned by a white male veteran. I have reported on two such guys in the past when I reported on the Jerry Rivers and the drug connection with Alex. But this one? This one is especially bad because this guy is on social media shaming other people and denouncing government officials and making accusations against them denouncing courts and judges whilst being a criminal himself. As much as he wants attention now, he apparently threatened lawsuits and cease and desist letters against people, including a journalist who posted about him. But this story did make several papers at the time. Before this happened, he had also sought attention for himself and his business, even appearing on TV. But after the stories about him broke, that's when he started to hide behind the name Crime and Cask. This fraud case began in August of 2022 when this indictment was filed in federal court on the 23rd. We see him affiliated with Grayson and May, a seafood distributorship in Fort Mill, South Carolina. The indictment mentions two types of small business loans. There was this PPP program, which stood for Paycheck Protection Program, and EIDL, Economic Injury Disaster Loans Program. And what they were for was for fixed debts, payroll, accounts payable, and bills resulting from the pandemic. In the loan agreements that were signed by the applicants, they signed stating that these proceeds would be used for working capital and it provided limits on how this money was to be distributed. These loans could be in the amount of 10000 to $2 million. The indictment goes on that in or about October 2021, James engaged in a scheme to defraud the Small Business Administration. He utilized the funds obtained from this loan 
for unauthorized purchases, including investments in cryptocurrency through multiple platforms. And it lists some of them instead of legitimate business purposes that they were intended for. So he applied for a $200,000 loan. And very much in Alex Murdoch fashion, once the amount was received into his personal bank account, he opened a small business checking account in the same bank and transferred the funds to this new account. And this was all done in his own name. No one else was involved. Now it's what he did after that that's problematic. From this new account, he starts purchasing cryptocurrency in several different amounts, totaling about $113,000. Here's a list of those purchases from this indictment, and they are counts 1 through 16 under wire fraud. Because this money was meant to be used for his business, he's also charged with count 17, theft of government property for unauthorized purchases. So in this indictment, the federal government is requesting that these funds be paid back, and it lists the cryptocurrency bank accounts, and also real estate. And if anything listed here is no longer available, then he has to substitute the value somehow. In spite of all this evidence, when he's arraigned on September 20th, 2022, he pleads not guilty. And then we have a small flurry of motions filed, discovery is shared, we have some expert testimony that cannot be refuted, and so on July 18th of 2023, a new count document appears. This one has only one charge, and it's a much lesser charge than the 17 before. We see count one, which is the only count, false statement, basically saying he lied to the government about what he intended to use the loan that was meant exclusively to keep small businesses afloat during the pandemic for. And we know by this document that he was planning on changing his plea. And we see this plea agreement filed a few days later on July 20th, 2023, admitting five things. The defendant made a statement or representation. The statement was false, fictitious, and fraudulent. The statement or representation was material. The defendant acted knowingly and willfully and that the statement pertained to a matter within the jurisdiction of the executive branch of the United States government. We see from this agreement that this count has a maximum penalty of a $250,000 fine, three years of supervised release, and $100 special assessment. And it looks like he's going to catch a big break that both sides agree to probation, besides repayment, fines, and fees, so long as he complies with the terms of this plea agreement. The state newspaper reported that he will likely only get probation. On July 25th, he signs his waiver of indictment, acknowledging his offenses have the potential for imprisonment for more than one year. And he enters his plea on July 25th, 2023. If you recall from going over Alex and Russell's federal sentencing, we know that there's some time in between the agreement and the actual hearing. And during that time, the government attorneys put forth a sentencing memorandum for what they would like the court to find. After that's submitted, then defense puts forth their brief, of course in an attempt to downgrade anything the government asks for. And then it's at the hearing that the judge determines what it will be. As we saw with Alex's case, he broke his terms of his plea agreement. The government attorneys asked for one thing, and the court ended up using an upward variance, and he got even more years. So this is where this case was. So on October 9th, he files for a motion for extension of time to answer this pre-sentence report by prosecution, and that's granted. Ten days later, he files a new one. This one states that he was undergoing substantial ongoing medical issues, and so the sentence hearing was going to need to be postponed. It was originally scheduled for December 5th, but they ask if they can update the court on January 8th to see where he is at that time. So the hearing is canceled, and the court gives him lots of time to recover, which is very interesting, because here we see him shamelessly promoting his book in the courtroom during Alex's hearing for a new trial on January 29th, 2024. So these substantial ongoing medical issues weren't keeping him out of a courtroom. They were just keeping him out of the federal courtroom for his own hearing. 
and we know what he's been up to since then. He's been busy writing this book with Myra the egg juror. So while he's busy focused on this new book, selling Alex and egg merchandise, and proclaiming Alex's innocence all over TikTok, his hearing has been rescheduled. It was decided on two weeks ago, on August 19th, and the date is coming up real soon, September 17th at 10 a.m. Now, in addition to this situation, there was another big one that also ended up in a lawsuit. It seems he likes to coach girls volleyball. He's had multiple jobs doing that, several of them not lasting the full term, due to certain accusations that keep arising. But he moves on to a different school and tries again. Why any man would continue after even just one accusation, instead of walking away, I'll never understand. But this article was written about the situation, and it was posted by one of his victim's aunts. And I'm all for her energy here. If someone messes with my niece or nephew, it's not their mama you need to be worried about. It's their crazy aunt, as you see in her tweet. She also tweeted about this article, saying that Jim had the story removed with some sort of lawsuit threat shortly after it was published, and that he was then fired from both a school and a volleyball club as their coach. So the name of this newspaper is Queen City Nerve, and the story was called At the Market. So in this article that you can find in this account on X, it addresses many accusations, such as him speaking inappropriately to minor girls at his place of business. These are multiple accusations. The niece of this account holder accuses him of groping her butt when the two go out by themselves to throw garbage away. As often happens with young girls, she was embarrassed at first, so she didn't say anything. She finally told her parents, who state that they filed a police report. Now, he could find one sealed police report linked to this business. A sexual situation involving a minor would in fact be sealed, but there's no way to confirm it is or isn't about that. Now, each of the other accusations that were made about him messaging inappropriately or speaking inappropriately are categorically denied by Jim. But the journalist who wrote this article states that he has viewed these inappropriate messages himself. I was also provided with screenshots of a couple of his now-deleted Facebook posts. And I must say that if I had a daughter in volleyball and saw her coach posting things like this, I would be writing letters to the school as well. These posts he made have nothing to do with the sport. They're not about a good play that was made, an exceptional player, the winning serve, nothing but these girls' bodies. And that's disturbing for a volleyball coach, especially one coaching middle school and high school girls. This lawsuit I spoke of earlier involved himself and a female colleague who was also a volleyball coach. Anonymous letters alleged to have been written by concerned parents were sent to different schools he worked at, and as stated earlier, they resulted in either his resignation or termination. He accused this teacher, this colleague, of being behind these, and so he takes her to court. This lawsuit was settled, directing both sides to avoid contact and communication with each other. But that's not the end of his legal troubles. He actually has a long list of them, going back to 2005, when he was sued by Michelin Tire for a bad faith registration of a domain name. He lost. In 2011, he had tax judgments brought against him by the IRS for unpaid taxes. In 2017, he was given a warning for selling misbranded and or non-inspected meat products at his fish market. Then, in 2020, we see something he was charged for in 2015 was disposed at this time in 2020 and cleared from his record. But at this time, there's no way to see what that was. So with all this in mind, two things. You can see why he'd want to defend Alex Murdoch. They seem to have a lot in common. But the second thing, it's very curious to me that some people have openly teamed up with him and are currently supporting him publicly in personal and professional avenues. For example, we see he was planning on releasing this book back in June. We see the same title, the same name. At this time, we see himself. Myra's name wasn't put out there yet, so she's known as Juror 785. There's an illustrator, an editor, and look who wrote the foreword. Dick Harputlian. Look at the price at this time. $9.99. This is the current book that's supposed to be released any day now. The price has more than doubled, and we see more names attached. 
They've also added Fitz News, Court TV, Lori Murray, and someone named Critical K. And we still have Dick Harpootlian on there. Why these people want to hook their names to him, I'll never understand. I, for one, will not be spending a penny on this monstrosity, especially after hearing Myra and Mandy in action. Nor would I ever knowingly support such a man. I want to thank the ex-posters that I named here and all of my crew here that support and encourage me every day. For those of you who may be newer to my channel, I do most of my releases as premieres with the live chat. Since I don't go live, that does give me some interaction with my subscribers, and I have some absolutely wonderful regulars who've been coming to support me since the very beginning when I first started. One day in chat, one of them named the group Cassidy's Crew, and I loved it. So that's why I say, hey crew, in my posts. And while I'm talking about my supporters, I want to thank my new members. Mark Walker. Mark was my first super chat, and now my first member. Then we have Fat Yoga, spelled P-H-A-T, not Fat, F-A-T, Mariah Kirk, Patty Dunn, Vanessa Fowler, Brenda Stone, and Jane Robertson Bloom. Thank you all so much for becoming members. You all had an early release of this video, and I want to plan a little member chat, so if you can respond to the post I put up, we'll find a good time for that. And you've all got that pink gavel for now. The colors will change with length of time as members. And you all have special emojis you can add to chats. So far we have Bubba, Judge Newman, Sir Creighton, and Miss Limehouse. I could only make four to start, but in time I'll be allowed to make more. So we'll see where that takes us. But thank you all so much for your support for my channel. And I want you to know it goes to good use. For expenses like Pacer, where I buy the federal documents like the ones on this podcast, my monthly subscriptions to the newspaper archives for my Murdoch Mafia series, streaming services like Fox Nation that I've used in updates, software subscriptions like Adobe and Microsoft, and also ink and paper. All the things that I happily do to bring you what I can, but your support, though not expected, is very much appreciated. So I wanted to shout you all out publicly. Till next time, this is Cassidy O'Connell saying stay well and stay tuned.